Hey folks, I'm Dave Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University. <clears throat> I'm a microbiology professor, and this is the third video in a series on coronaviruses. Uh, the first was just sort of the basic biology of coronaviruses in general. The second was focused more on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. And in this one, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the epidemiology, in other words, the statistics. What do we see as far as how it has spread? over the last several months uh, around the world. And then I want to talk a little bit about some of the restrictions that different municipalities have put into place regarding COVID, everything from masks to social distancing. So I've got some uh, graphs here to show you. These are as of today, April 29th, 2021. What you see here on the, the horizontal axis, the x-axis, our dates going back uh, to looks like around March or so of the previous year, 2020. And on the, the y-axis up and down, we have the total number of cases. And this in particular is for the globe. This is worldwide. We'll look specifically at the US and then at California even more specifically in just a minute. But you can see how there was a big pulse globally, um, a, a steady rise from April of 2020 through October of 2020, and then over the, the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, a pretty big jump and then a dip. And then you can see that globally, COVID cases are actually on the rise right now. What kind of numbers are we talking about? Uh, approximately 150 million confirmed cases as of today. And if you consider that out of uh, 7.8 billion people on the planet, that is a case rate, a total case rate of 1.9%. So we believe that at this point, just under 2% of the entire global population has been infected with COVID. Uh, now, how many of those 150 million people died? 3.15 million out of 150 million died, presumably from COVID-19. That's at 2.1%. We call that the mortality rate. So we've got a case rate of 1.9% and then a mortality rate of 2.1% globally. Now if we zoom in on the United States, we can see that when things really hit hard for us was this past November through January. And then in January, uh, it, uh, things started dropping pretty dramatically. And you can see for the United States, the current trend is is low and downward. That's all really good news. But let's look at how the U.S. has been hit over the past year. Uh, we've got about 333 million people in the country, and there were 32.3 million cases. That amounts to 9.7% of our population. So compare that to the 1.9% globally. Here in the United States, we have a much higher load than, um, than the world as a whole. Out of those 32.3 million cases, we've recorded so far 574,000 deaths. That is a death rate or mortality rate of 1.8%. So our total case rate is much higher, much higher than the global total case rate. And our death rate is slightly lower. And we can speculate uh, as to why there are differences here in the U.S., um, but that's not really my goal. My goal at this point is to get you up to speed on what we're seeing uh, around the planet and then zooming in on locally. So that's the U.S. So now let's finish by looking at California because that's where I'm located. As of today in California, you can see there was a, a big hump uh, last summer and then in November along with the rest of the country, it really uh, climbed. We had some big peaks through January and it has dropped back down almost to pre-COVID levels again. Out of just under 40 million people in the United in California, we've recorded 3.74 million cases. So that's a, a case rate of 9.5%. So much higher than the world, slightly lower than the, the US average. And the death rate, we've had 61.6 uh, thousand deaths out of 3.74 million cases. And that's a mortality rate of 1.6%. So our total case rate's been a little lower than the nation as has our uh, our death rate here in California. 
Now, a lot of people uh, have talked a lot about uh, the COVID restrictions, everything from masks to school closures to social distancing and whether or not they work. <clears throat> and so I wanted us to just consider what, what have been some of those COVID restrictions at the state and county level. Well, uh, in some cases, it's simply quarantining sick individuals or in some cases, universal quarantining for a particular number of days or weeks. Everybody's supposed to stay at home. Uh, social distancing, we all have been part of discussions as to how far apart we should be standing when we're in groups or sitting in classrooms. Uh, mask requirements, nothing has triggered more frustration, anger, emotion than mask requirements uh, in this whole thing. Uh, school and church closures, restaurant and bar closures, other quote-unquote non-essential business closures. I'm not here to judge what's essential and what's not essential, but um, we know that that language has been used for closing businesses uh, in order to, to try to keep down the interactions between people. Um, COVID testing itself, uh, in some cases, is required to enter certain places or to travel or to, um, to attend college, etc. Various travel restrictions and so on. There have been lots of different combinations of restrictions. And, and we can all argue about which of these might be useful, might not be useful. Let's look at the restrictions collectively and ask whether we think they have been useful. So what I did was I found per capita COVID-19 case rates for all 50 states plus Washington, D.C. So there are 51 data points and rank them one through 51. So who has the most cases per uh, total cases, not per week, but total cases cumulatively who has had the most cases per 100,000 people in their population. So population density is not taken into account directly. It's per 100,000 people, and they were ranked. And I found that those data from Becker's Hospital Review, you can look that up if you're interested. And I thought, well, how am I going to quantify uh, restrictiveness and different restrictions? And I came across a really great article from Wallet Hub, uh, an economist writer, uh, back in March, so th these data are from March 2nd and March 15th, so back in March, where he ranked all 50 states plus D.C., how convenient for me, um, 1 through 51 in terms of how restrictive they were. And so all I did was took these two separate unrelated data sets and did what's called a regression analysis. I plotted one against the other. So you see across the top the restrictiveness ranking. So number one in the restrictive, restrictiveness ranking would be the most restrictive according to the 14 criteria that the people at Wallet Hub came up with. Number 51 would be the least restrictive criteria. So, so these are over at this end, the least restrictive states. At this end, to the left, we've got the most restrictive states. And then the per capita case rankings, number one would mean the most cases. And number 51 would be the fewest cases. So what we see then is a general trend that says that as we get less and less restrictive, moving from left to right, we see more and more cases per capita as we move from bottom to top. Let me say that again. As we get less restrictive, moving from left to right along this graph, as states get less and less restrictive, we see higher and higher case rates per 100,000 people in their population. Is this a good predictor? How much scatter is in the data, etc.? Well, stati statisticians use a couple factors to, to estimate how good the data are. R squared is called the correlation coefficient, uh, or rather, pardon me, R is our correlation coefficient. And R is basically saying, are these data actually correlated to one another? And the highest value you can get is a 1, and the lowest value is a 0. So if they were completely scattered randomly and there was no pattern to them, you'd get an R value of 0. If they were all perfectly in line with one another, you'd, you'd get an R value of 1. Our R value is 0.6757, which is categorized as moderate to strong correlation. Moderate to strong. And in fact, if I ran a, an analysis of variance called an ANOVA to say, well, statistically speaking, how strong actually is that correlation? The number I came up with is that the probability of getting this scatter of data, this, this spread of data that we see here, randomly, 
with no correlation whatsoever, these are two totally unrelated events, is 1 in 18,757,994. So 1 in about 19 million is the possibility, the probability, that you could get a scatter that has this trend just randomly. In other words, we've got pretty strong evidence that there's a correlation here, right? A pretty strong ev evidence that there's a correlation here. R square is a little more subtle, a little trickier. Again, it runs from 0 to 1. R square value tells us how well restrictiveness ranking predicts the per capita case rate uh, rankings. In other words, how well does, does the degree of restrictiveness of a state predict how many cases per 100,000 they're likely to have? And again, it's out of 1, and so we've got a, a, an R-square value of 0.45, which isn't 0, but it's certainly not a 1. One way to interpret this is to say that, okay, restrictiveness, restrictiveness ranking is a moderately good predictor of the per capita caseload that a particular state is going to have. The more restrictive they are, the lower the caseload is going to be. In other words, the per capita case rate. The less restrictive they are, the higher the case rate is going to be for them. If you think of, maybe you could imagine making a list of all the various factors involved in how many people in a state per 100,000 are going to get COVID or did get COVID. You could probably imagine a lot of different factors. We can think about, I don't know, demographics, ethnicities, age distribution, um, how much people in that state trust their government or trust the biomedical sciences. Um, you name it, right? We could, we could come up with all kinds of factors that are probably all legit. What that 0.4565 R-square value tells us is that approximately 45, 46% of that, of all the factors involved in, in determining uh, the, the case rate in a given state come down to the restrictiveness of the state policies. The restrictiveness of the state policy, policies accounts for about 45 or 46 percent of the various components that go into determining the caseload. I hope that makes sense. Think about it, play it back a couple of times, shoot me a note if there's something confusing in the way that I worded that. Let me give you just an example. Um, the least restrictive state so state ranked number, under, under the restrictiveness rankings, ranked number 51, remember we're including District of Columbia, was Iowa. Iowa had the lowest ranking of restrictions through all of, uh, of COVID up until at least March 15th, when this, or March 2nd when this article came out. And they ranked with the eighth highest of all states in the country in caseload per capita. So they were the least restrictive and they had the eighth highest caseload. At the opposite end, the most restrictive was Virginia, and it ranked 41st on the list, way down close to the bottom. The perfect world, maybe it would have been number 51, but it wasn't. They're scattered to the data, as you can see on the screen here. But generally speaking, the two extremes are good predictors, and everything in between, largely with some exceptions, are really good predictors as well. Now, I've heard uh, people saying, well, you know, what about Florida versus California? California was so restrictive, and we still have all these problems. Well, California, I can't remember exactly which one on the, on the map here. It's somewhere right around here. California is um, pretty close to the line. Florida, on the other hand, is over here. Florida is one of the outliers, and I'm happy for Florida, right? They, they have a very low total case rate. That's awesome. Can we explain it? No. And restrictiveness apparently didn't factor into their their good fortune. Um, but just comparing California to Florida doesn't dismiss all the rest of these data. And that's one thing I would just argue that you think about is don't make don't jump to conclusions based on select data points. Try to get a hold of as much of the data as you can and do an analysis of that data. And when we do that, what we see is nationwide, it does appear that our COVID restrictions are having an impact, a positive impact in saving a lot of lives. Um, you know, let's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish here by showing you a really recent map 
from the CDC. This is actually the seven day case rate per 100,000. So not the total cumulative like I've been showing you, but just in a given week. And as of yesterday, the 28th of April, 2021, what you see is that California is actually the very lowest. So after all this hard work, California is now at the lowest rate of all 50 states and or DC. Sadly, Florida has climbed quite a bit and is near the top. Florida has almost the highest, not the highest, but they are almost at the highest. So again, not here to point fingers at anybody, but to say that let's not pick and choose data that we like that supports an argument that we've already we've already come to the conclusion in our own mind. Let's instead try to look at the whole picture and say what can we learn from the whole picture. So speaking of which, what have we learned from this whole picture today? Uh, global case rate is 1.9 percent while nationally in the U.S. it's at 9.7 percent. So the U.S. we're getting hit hard. There's no doubt about that relative to the to the world. The global death rate is 2.1 percent while nationally in the U.S. it's 1.8 percent. So we are doing a little better in terms of the percentage of our population that is succumbing and dying from COVID. California's case rate and death rate are both slightly below the U.S. national average, 9.5 percent and 1.6 percent respectively. And the state level restrictions, and this comes back to that uh, graph that I, I generated and showed you, the state level restrictions are in fact a good predictor of, of overall cumulative COVID case rate per 100,000 people. All right, spend some time with this. Feel free to look up the data that I cited on uh, two slides ago uh, and uh, um, dig into this yourself. Make sure you're convinced that these, these numbers are, are legit and they are real. And again, resist the temptation to look at just one or two data points and draw any broad conclusions from those. Thanks, guys.